Pope Francis has declared this a year of mercy. What does this mean for us? What does it ask of us? Join us today as we talk about the nature of mercy and how we show it to others with our special guest, Father Michael Gately, the author of You Did It To Me, A Practical Guide to Mercy in Action. I'm Michael Hernan, Vice President of Advancement at Franciscan University in Steubenville, Ohio, and you're watching Franciscan University Presents. Stay with us. Welcome to Franciscan University Presents. Uh, today we'll be talking about mercy uh, in this wonderful year of mercy. I'm your host, Michael Hernan, Vice President of Advancement here at Franciscan University in Steubenville, Ohio. And I'm joined in our studios here by our regular panelist, Dr. Regis Martin, Professor of Systematic Theology here at Franciscan University, and Dr. Scott Hahn, who holds the Father Michael Scanlon Chair in Biblical Theology and the New Evangelization. And we are also so uh, proud to welcome back an alumnus, Father Michael Gately, uh, priest of the Marian uh, the Marians of the Immaculate Conception. Mm -hmm. You're currently the Director of Evangelization for the Marian Fathers. You often give lectures, retreats on mercy and Marian consecration. You've written a number of books, which we've all consumed very, very quickly. Uh, but the topic of today's book is uh, You Did It To Me, A Practical Guide to Mercy in Action. So welcome back, Father Michael. Thanks very much. It's good to be back again. Well, so, so we're in a year of mercy. Mm -hmm. And so let, let's start with a foundation. Very simple question for you. What is mercy? Sure. Mercy, you know, there's a lot of different definitions of it, but um, Pope John Paul II de described mercy as love's second name. Mm -hmm. uh, and in his encyclical letter on mercy, Divis Misericordia, and then he goes on to talk about how mercy is a kind of particular form of love when it encounters poverty, weakness, brokenness, and sin. Um, Pope Benedict talks about mercy as the central nucleus of the gospel. Uh, the Catechism of the Catholic Church uh, says that mercy is the gospel. It's the good news of God's mercy for sinners. Mm -hmm. And what we learn from sacred, sacred scripture, for instance, um, the, in the, uh, the Good Samaritan, um, it's a two movements. You know, in the story of the Good Samaritan, it's a movement of the heart. It's first being moved to compassion, okay. seeing the suffering of others and having your heart move. But it's not enough just to have your heart go out to someone who's suffering. There also has to be action, like the Good Samaritan acted, uh, and he did something to help alleviate suffering. So I say, you know, kind of in a nutshell then, with all of that together, I would say mercy is really heart and arms. It's the, the movement of the heart, not having a hard, hardened heart, but a heart that moves, is moved by com compassion for those who are suffering, and then takes action to help alleviate the suffering and, and uh, provide assistance. And you've really already defined it, probably, but you know, is, is it worth looking at what mercy is not? You know, what, what, what did we... Yeah, I mean, it was interesting. I, I, was, I once went to the first World Apostolic Congress on Divine Mercy. They, these the big congresses they have in Rome and different places uh, throughout the world where cardinals and bishops come together. And I remember I went to the first one and there was a talk that, that just something in the talk blew me away. Cardinal Christoph Schonborn, the editor of the Catechism yes, of the Catholic yes. Church, he said, uh, he described, he said, um, you know, the, the greatest uh, sin against God and man is hardness of heart. Hmm. He said, hardness of heart is the opposite of mercy. And what I just was sharing about how mercy is those two movements, it's the heart and the arms. Yes. Mercy doesn't even get off the ground unless our hearts are moved. Right. Wow. And if we have hardness of heart, then there is no mercy. Yeah, there's a, a technical uh, theological term for that. It's called obduracy. Uh, and it represents a, a lack of any tenderness, huh. any movement of, of the heart, mm. of pathos for the suffering of another. And once you fall into that state, uh, it's very difficult to uh, pull back, uh, difficult for God to reach you. Uh, and it's ironic because those are the ones who most need mercy. Yeah. Um, and it, it's interesting, the reason why it struck me so much when the Cardinal said that, is I suddenly looked into my own heart and I said, <laughs> I've got yeah. some of that hardness yeah, in heart. Sure. Yeah. And you know, because yeah. I, I was thinking and you know, I, there's been a lot of trials and difficulties the previous five years and yeah. sometimes when we're, when we're sinned against our own sins, our hearts start to harden and, and I remember thinking to myself, how do I solve this? Right. Yeah. And I just cried out for mercy. I said, yeah. Lord, please heal my heart. Mm. And, well, it, it's really helpful. But it's only grace, only grace. In fact, that's what Cardinal Sean Warren said. Right. 
Only the, the grace of God, only the mercy of God right. can open up a breach in our hardened hearts. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Only He can do it because it's a miracle of, yeah. of you know, the, that we need new hearts. Yeah. That, that distinction you drew between love and mercy, I think, is very useful because love is something you can easily sentimentalize. You can cheapen it, debase it. But mercy, uh, you have a tougher time uh, mm -hmm. uh, uh, sort of debasing that. Uh, and it's love in action. Uh, it's, it's not uh, soft soap or sentimentality. It's sacrificial. It's also not leniency. In other words, yeah. when God shows mercy, it isn't just like, well, boys will be boys, I'll turn a blind eye, you know. I think a lot of people approach divine mercy as though God is just simply tolerating things, you know. Mm. But in fact, our, our, our misery is what evokes that compassion from God. He reaches down and raises us up. But He doesn't stop by raising us up. He empowers us to kind of look at other people who are, who are alongside of us and right. to reach out. You know, the, the Hebrew term hesed is one of the most untranslatable words in the, in the Old Testament and frequently gets translated as mercy because hesed is really the content of the covenant. And that's what makes it so untranslatable because when you're looking at covenant in terms of sacred kinship, you know, then what obligations do you have towards your spouse, you know, towards your kids, towards your siblings? And it's so variegated, it's so diverse, and yet the common core is that family love. Well, family can be a closed circle. You know, it's our home, our household, you know, not outsiders. But hesed, mercy, is sort of what transforms family into an open circle so that suddenly you realize that God has had compassion upon me, this prodigal son, this runaway, you know, this rebel. And so it's what evokes that sort of desire to show, because, you know, when you look at the corporal and spiritual works of mercy, it's basically a parental job description. You know, clothing the naked, feeding the hungry. And it's what parents are doing that nobody notices, but it's noticed when suddenly you begin doing it to people who are not in your inner family circle. Yeah. And that's what God the Father does through the Son. He reaches down and finds the most miserable sinners like me and then draws us into His family. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, there's a, a revealing passage uh, in, in Mother Teresa where she says, it's not enough to say God loves you. That doesn't really carry the freight. He is thirsting for you. And that's a gesture of mercy. Uh, that's, that's when love gets parlayed into action. It's not just an abstraction. It's not just a feeling. It's work. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Maybe you could just un unpack a little bit. You talk in the book about the three degrees of mercy. Mm -hmm. um, what are they and why is that important? You know, the, the three degrees of mercy comes from uh, the writings of, of St. Faustina Kowalska in her diary. And uh, St. Faustina was a mystic. She died last century. And um, the Lord said to her, I, I want to, he, he said, I'm going to give you three ways of exercising mercy towards your neighbor uh, in three degrees. The first degree is in deed. The second degree is in word. And the third degree is through prayer. Mm. He says, in these three degrees is the, is the fullness of mercy. Um, mm. Faustina then later reflected on that and said, you know, th 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 those degrees really represent that first to try and do a deed of mercy. Uh, that is to actively alleviate, try to act, take action to alleviate the suffering of others having your, after your heart's been moved. Uh, but if you can't do a deed of mercy, a word of mercy, a word of encouragement, say something to someone that will lift them up, alleviate their suffering. Mm. If you can't do a deed, if you can't speak a word of mercy, then there's always prayer. Now, it doesn't mean prayer is always the last place, but it's if it's within our power to do a deed of mercy or speak a word of mercy, we do that first. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I just uh, had an example. One of, unfortunately, one of, the, one of the, the guys in my community, an older brother, passed away a couple days ago. And uh, one of the brothers was very close with him. And um, <clears throat> I saw him in the hallway, and I, I didn't want to say anything. I just went to the chapel, and I was praying for the repose of the soul of his brother Fred. And I came back out and he was there again and I thought, oh, it was, it was much easier to go into the chapel right, to pray right. than yeah. when I saw him and I thought, oh, no. and I just went up to him because I knew he was grieving and sometimes you want to, you know, avoid Give people who are grieving. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I went up to him and I, and I said, uh, I said, John, um, I'm very sorry for, the, for your loss and, and I'm going to be praying for you. And it was just that little action. It, you could see his face just kind of relieved. Yeah. That's really what is meant by the three degrees of mercy that we, um, Always pray. Prayer is beautiful because it can reach even where if we can't do deeds. But if it's within our power to do a deed of mercy or word of mercy, that's what the Lord wants us to do mm -hmm. uh, above all. Mm. I just think it's amazing that you have a saint in the church, a mystic, and their first is as action. 
you know, that, that too quickly we just say, oh, well, oh, we'll pray for the world. But she's saying, first, let's go and serve those closest to us. Let's use the word as well as pray. Never, never undermining by any means or belittling prayer, but that it's about out there. It's, well, a, it's giving of ourselves. And what's important to remember, you know, the, the saints and the mystics and these things, all of this is pointing us back to sacred scripture, right? Yes. It's not like this is a new revelation. Right. The heart of it is, though, is it really comes from the words of our Lord, Matthew 25, which is based on the title of the book, is, you know, where, where the Lord says, you did it to me. Like, if you, uh, if you clothe the hungry, feed the thirsty, like, Lord, when did, we, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or, or naked or, or in prison? Whatever you did to the least of mine, you did, you did it to me. Mm. Whatever you didn't do, you didn't right. do to me. Right, that's right. And that's, that is, I mean, uh, uh, to me, that's my favorite, one of my favorite passages and also my, my least favorite passage right. of all right. scripture. It's very convicting. Because it tells us, you know, sometimes there's all this speculation, what's gonna happen at the end of the world? We know it's gonna happen. Yeah. There's, the Lord is gonna be there and he's gonna say, either you did it to me and that will be the one, most wonderful words that we ever hear. And he said, enter in the joy of your father. Yes. Or he'll say, you did not do it to me. Right. And, and we depart from him. Right. Mm -hmm. it, it's, so, it's, so deeds, God demands deeds of mercy right. from us. It, it's because Jesus is himself mercy through and through right down to the bottom of his toes, that he can identify so completely with those who suffer. Uh, that solidarity, that note is struck. We certainly see it in the case of, uh, of Paul. Right. Uh, you know, I, I didn't even know you, Jesus, and yet here I am persecuting you. Or my favorite story, it, it's so charming, Martin of Tours. You know, uh, the, 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 the pagan who became a Christian and as a Roman soldier rides into a village in the dead of winter and there's a guy without a cloak. Instinctively, he cuts his cloak in half, shares it with this beggar, and that night in a dream, Jesus appears to him. I mean, he's stupefied by this. I didn't know you were Jesus, yeah. but he identifies that completely uh, with uh, the beggar. Mm. You know, this is sort of like the flip side of what Saul discovered on the road to Damascus. Saul, Saul, why do you persecute not my followers, but me? Mm -hmm. I mean, that radical identification that Jesus makes with each of us and those who are around us that we might not even notice, it's not just a kind of moral solidarity. It is a sacramental bond. It's sacramental consanguinity. It is a family bond of divine kinship that we so easily miss. You know, until we look in the mirror and realize, wait, that's my only hope, and so I've got to share this. What I like about your book is that you give practical steps. You also show how it can be done in little ways, you know, like giving up soft drinks, you know, <laughs> that one example, or the little boy, five loaves and two fish. It's enough. <laughs> Jesus can multiply the loaves right, and feed the right. 5,000 yeah. with whatever yeah. we do give, you know. Yeah. Yeah. That's encouraging. Yeah. Yeah, that, that's really a striking feature, I, I think, of mercy. It's not spectacular no. or, or dramatic. It's, it's modest and small. Uh, little gestures like uh, going out and uh, uh, sort of embracing that grieving brother and, right. and letting him know that you're really sorry, that you're going to pray for him. That, that wasn't, that's not cheap grace. Yeah. That can be costly. So when, when the church has traditionally talked about mercy in action. It's talked about the spiritual and the corporal works of mercy. You also talk about kind of a scriptural, uh, you know, uh, approach, if you will, to a list of, of acts of mercy. D do you want to distinguish between those two a little yeah, bit? Yeah, um, there's a scriptural approach and a traditional approach. Real, real quick, right before I said there, just, you said something extraordinary, just a thought, if I could just reflect on that for a minute. So we're talking about the works of mercy, they're modest, they're not, they're small things. But the amazing thing is it's in these little things, really the question of the works of mercy is a question of salvation. Right. It's a huge thing right. in yeah. the little things. Yeah. Mm -hmm. it's, it's that we're, God demands for us deeds of mercy and that's, you know, the, the whole parable of the, the Good Samaritan, yeah. it, the, it, it, the whole, it begins with someone asking the question, what do I have to do for eternal life? Yeah, yeah. right, yeah. The, the works, well, love God, love your neighbor. Who's my neighbor? this and do likewise, show mercy. Right, right. That it's a small thing, but it's a huge thing. Right. And in that way, it really imitates God. I mean, the immensity of the love yeah, of the exactly. yeah. becomes a zygote. Yeah, the, the, the baby and Jesus, and they're in the, yeah. the, the incarnation, the, the, the eternal God. I mean, it's, it's the small things, but they, they lead to huge things. Yeah. Now, so to, to answer your question about the traditional approach and the spiritual approach, you know, one of the, the, the big uh, strategies, I think, of Pope Francis 
is, uh, and not just Pope Francis, uh, but like Pope John Paul II, Pope Benedict, the Second Vatican Council, it's getting back to the essence of things. Mm. I think Pope Francis' strategy with the new evangelization and you know uh, his, his apostolic exhortation about uh, Gaud uh, Gaudium... Uh, <laughs> Evangelii Gaudium. Thank you very Glory much. The Latin, I always yeah. get tripped up. <laughs> but the idea is, it, it's saying, let's get back to the essence of things here. Yes. And so, for me, and he says, you know, sometimes there's traditional language and sometimes it's a little hard for us and it trips us up. Let's just get right to the essence. Let's not throw away any of that, but let's look at the essence and then go back at some of these things. And for me, the traditional, you know, 14 categories of the spiritual and corporal works of mercy, right. they're great. It's a great list, but I always forget it. I mean, if you ask me, yeah. what's the 14? Okay, I know this, this, but to just kind of rattle them all off. And, you know, so the traditional approach is the 14, spirit, right. 14 you know, seven corporal, seven spiritual. But what I, what I call the scriptural um, categories of the works of mercy comes from Matthew 25. And I actually conflate uh, feed the hungry and give, drink to the thirsty, because the right. catechism does. Right. But you got five, right? Um, uh, let's see, I, I, I'm hungry. tested. Uh, let's feed see, the, the hungry. <laughs> I got to remember high school ninja step word. Okay, <laughs> feed the hungry, uh, get, uh, welcome the stranger, yeah. st school ninjas, uh, the naked, uh, stab the sick, uh, and those who are in prison. That's right. Now, what's interesting <laughs> about that is you got five, and I think those 14 actually fit within the five. And that's right. what I tried to yeah. put together in yes. the book. The reason that's important is for the very reason I remember I was on the plane on the way here. I knew we were going to be talking about this. <laughs> okay, I got I to gotta get this in my mind a little bit because I got all this office and, the, and the, the funeral and all these things in my mind. And I thought, okay, I didn't have the book with me. It's up in the, in the, you know, the, the, the baggage thing. I think, okay, I can't re review the book. How do I do this? I thought, oh yeah, just remember the five. There you go. And for the whole flight, I was just meditating on those five things. And it was such right. a fruitful meditation. It's the idea of keeping it simple, right. but then letting it expand to the others. Not throwing away the others, but getting to the essence of it. So there's the scriptural, which is what we find, see in Matthew 25. Yes. But it's also what the tradition gives us in the 14, which is also based on sacred scripture. And I want to expound on that more later. <laughs> Stay with us for the next segment at Franciscan <laughs> University Presents. For me, the year of mercy is just accepting the mercy and love that God has given us through our Lord Jesus Christ. For this year of mercy, our household, Children of the Lord, has decided to go to confession once a week. In this confession, we learn about God's mercy and forgiveness, and it's a really great way for us to understand just how loving our God can be throughout this year. I'm in Daughters of Divine Mercy household here on campus, and the reason that mercy is so important to me is because through it I really see God's love. It's in His mercy that it truly encapsulates Christ's sacrifice for us on the cross. People recognize Franciscan University as being academically excellent and passionately Catholic. We have the unique opportunity through our faculty members, through our students, to proclaim that academic excellence by reaching out in many different ways. We also remain passionately Catholic in the way in which we are able to worship, the way in which we are able to uh, bring that love of Christ to others on a daily basis. It's important for us to be able to embrace both. Welcome back to Franciscan University Presents. We've been talking about mercy with Father Michael Gately and his, uh, his great book here, You Did It to Me, A Practical Guide to Mercy in Action. Um, so Father Michael, we're in a year of mercy. What's its significance? What is, why did the Pope do this? And what does that mean for us as Catholics? Sure. Yeah, I think, I think the year of mercy in the mind of, of Pope Francis is really for two main reasons. Uh, one. I think it has to do with evangelization. Um, again, I think his strategy in, for the new evangelization is getting back to the essence of things. And as Pope Benedict said, the central nucleus of the gospel message is God's mercy for sinners. And so I think he wants the church to be reflecting on that central nucleus of the gospel as the proclamation. He said, you know, there's, it's not to put anything else aside, but there's a hierarchy of truths as he talks about in Evangelium Gaudium. Mm. And right now, the truth that really should be at the forefront of the church's consciousness is mercy because mm -hmm. it's part of the evangelization. It's what, as he puts it, makes our faith attractive to those who are lost or, or forgotten or uh, you know, have issues with the church is to remind them of the cen center of it and then everything else flows from there. So first I think it's, it's part of his strategy for the new evangelization, which was part of the strategy of Pope Benedict, part of the strategy of John Paul II, part of the strategy of Vatican II. Yes. The second thing is I think it's because we need it. Hmm. Uh, you know, more than ever. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, I think often of Romans 5, verse 20, 
where sin abounded, grace, grace abounded all the more. Yes. That we are in a time of, in some ways, unprecedented evil. And part of the insight of John Paul II, there's lots of blessings in the modern world, but in some ways, evil has a reach now like no other time in the history of the world. So, so but God is not outdone by evil. Mm -hmm. And He gives even greater grace and mercy. And I really see uh, the declaration of the year of mercy is really a gift to us, uh, especially when we're tempted to despair and get discouraged when we look around at the world. And it's a reminder for us to give us hope and to realize that we can call out for mercy and that it is effective, this love that's more powerful than evil and that can bring not only good out of evil, but an even greater good out of evil. Mm -hmm. Well, if, if you ask yourself, what really is at the heart of the gospel? What is the good news? It has to be mercy, yes. that God is willing, uh, in fact, He delights in dispensing what we don't deserve. Imagine if the good news were justice. You're going to get just what you deserve. I mean, nobody would be drawn to a, a, a message like that. Uh, I have a, a colleague who tells his students, if you come to class, uh, you're going to get mercy. If you don't come, you're going to get justice. <laughs> nobody wants justice. Yeah. They want mercy, uh, but nobody deserves it. Yeah. Yeah. You know, in his, in his bowl of indiction, Pope Francis points out in Misericordia Voltus, which announced the great jubilee of divine mercy, he quotes St. Thomas Aquinas and shows that, you know, mercy is not a sign of divine weakness, but it's actually a sign of divine omnipotence. Mm -hmm. and, and sometimes I have students who will write on their final exams, mercy is God's greatest attribute. <laughs> and they're right, but I, I think I what they're that. wrong about it. Yeah. <laughs> You know, it isn't like, well, there's a smorgasbord. Well, you know, there's, there's power, there's knowledge, there's goodness. Oh, mercy, you know, I'll start with this. The fact is, you know, what Aquinas is pointing out, what Pope Francis is pointing out, is mercy is precisely how God coordinates all of his attributes. So it's his power, it's his knowledge, it's his goodness adding up to a love in action. You know, and so when you look at you know, as you just said, quoting Romans 5, where sin abounds, grace abounds all the more. Well, where did sin abound the most of all? Mm. On Good Friday, yeah. when we crucified the Son of God. You know, and yet the greatest evil in the history of, 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 of the human race is precisely the wellspring of the salvation of the human race. So the greatest evil we've ever committed against God becomes the source of the greatest good He's ever shown us. And that's not exceptional. I think that kind of creates a paradigm so that we can see how things will unfold in our lives through His mercy. We keep falling because of our weakness and sin, but we keep falling upward like a divine trampoline of sorts, I suppose, you know. And it just gives you constant hope that no matter what I discover about my lowliness, He's going to raise me to heights that I can't even imagine. Mm -hmm. At the same time, you point out, John Paul rocked your world. Mm -hmm. And when you mentioned that, he, he rocked mine too, because he was talking about the necessity of discovering mercy mm -hmm. and how that can prevent a setback of unfathomable consequences for civilization. Now, John Paul was not a man given to hyperbole or exaggera exaggeration. You could almost feel the rhetorical restraint. He knows that something is awaiting the human race for all of the sins that have mounted to the heavens, you know. And yet, just as it was on Good Friday, so it can be in the 21st century. If we soften our hearts, if we turn to Him in our misery, His misericordia, that divine heart will, 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 will respond to us. I mean, if that doesn't rock our world, something else of catastrophic proportions will, yeah. you know. And in, in a, a former book of yours, The Consoling the Heart of Jesus, you, you talk about really accepting mercy, understanding Christ's mercy, about how we can assuage uh, in our own lives uh, the, the, um, the wounds of Christ. Um, in this book, you, you draw us out uh, in a very practical way of, of that love in action, of mercy uh, in action. So as we look at those works of mercy we talked about earlier in the last segment, I mean, are there deeper meanings as we look at some of these, you know, starting with, you know, the, the hungry and the thirsty, knowing, the, um, knowing them that, that might be just very simple. Oh, okay, so I have to go out and feed the hungry, I have to feed the thirsty. Is there something more um, that we need to look at as Catholics, particularly in this year of mercy, at some of these mystery or some of these mercies? Um, yeah, for the works of mercy, I think in a certain sense there's a deeper meaning for all of the works of mercy in that that we don't look at as a, you know boxes to check off. Uh, okay, fed the hungry, got that done. I think the essence of it, and this, this I think goes back to the strategy with, with Pope Francis, is, <clears throat> is that mercy needs to be a response to the mercy that we ourselves have received from the Lord. Mm. Um, so, you know, for instance, like feed the hungry. 
before we go out and feed the hungry of others, it's to real, recognize that the food that we eat every day comes as a gift from our Heavenly Father, not to lose the practice of praying before meals and really being thankful, not just have it be a routine or not to neglect it, but to think, the Lord, like the Father is giving me this food as a gift. That's right. That I have this food to eat. There's, there's millions of people who are starving. To realize that all of the works of mercy, it's, a, it's our response to the mercy and love that we ourselves have received. And I think that's why we're focusing on the year of mercy. Is it, it begins with that experience of the mercy of the Father in our own lives. It's, it's really honing in on that. Oh yeah, I know about mercy. Do we Got know it. about it? Oh yeah, of course I know. God loves. Do we know that? Like, do we, are we getting it? Because to the degree, and I believe in a certain sense, to the degree that we understand ourselves as forgiven and experience the mercy of God in our own lives, that's the degree that we're going to be able to show mercy to others. So for all of the works of mercy, I think that really is the deeper meaning, that it needs to arise from a personal encounter with the mercy of God. And that's why Pope Francis in Evangelium Gaudium talks about that, where does the joy of the gospel come from? It comes from an encounter with Jesus Christ in His mercy. Yeah. And that's, you know, you talk about consoling the heart of Jesus. That whole book was about coming to that encounter. Yeah. This book is about now going into action having had that encounter. But if we're, if we're not beginning with that experience of love from the Lord, then the works of mercy become do-goodery. You know, it yeah. just, <laughs> like, right. it, it needs to arise out of our gratitude and our thanksgiving for what He's done for us. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what we need to rediscover, and that's where the fire gets lit to do the works of mercy, so that the works of mercy, in a certain sense, become easy. Yeah. 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 Uh, you know, Chesterton says that the first obligation of religious man is gratitude uh, mm -hmm. for a gift he could never himself give, and that's being life. I mean, that's the origin of mercy, that we exist. It's not a function yes. of justice. He doesn't owe us being, but He gives us life, and so we ought to be thankful. And it has to be practical. I mean, that's what I like so much about this Pope. Uh, he exhorts us, I, I know this is a sort of time-sensitive show, we can't give away the date, but since uh, these waves of, uh, of refugees have been sweeping across the world for a long time now, the Pope specifically exhorts every parish uh, to welcome a family. Right. That's mercy in action. Right. I mean, it, it's very easy to theorize about it, romanticize That's about so it, but you know, as Dostoevsky tells us, it's only love when it becomes harsh, dreadful, and commits you to something painful, something sacrificial. You know, it's canonic. Uh, and that's what we have to imitate Jesus uh, in doing for those who have not. Yeah. It's a paradox because on the one hand you say it's not just do-goodery, it's not just when it's convenient. On the other hand, you also point out that it gets easier because of how we open our hearts to the, the mercy of God and begin to see ourselves. That, that you know, Christ is in the poorest of the poor, you know, so we see Christ in the poorest of the poor, but we also discover ourselves, that we're poorer than we ever mm -hmm. thought, yeah. and that Christ has entered into solidarity with us, with me. And I think that's what makes it easier, because it's sort of like, how can I do otherwise without just strangling, without just shriveling, without shrinking up the whole flow of that into my life? I'm reminded of that movie Schindler's List, right. where this factory owner is buying off the Jews from the Nazis, you know, and it's convenient, and, and it's profitable, but in the end, you know, his own heart has been touched yeah. by this, yeah. so that when they're being liberated, he looks at his watch and he realizes one more person, you know, and then he begins to weep about how many more opportunities he could have, you know, he had, but he didn't take advantage of. And I, and I think, you know, I don't want to get to the end of my life and, and feel that way, but I just, you know, and, and unless I change this year, I'm going to. That's right. You know, That's right. And it's a beautiful this is a time. Challenge. Yeah, it's a beautiful Grace time. And, and what, what you're describing too, it's 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 reminding me of because your question was also about like the, is there a deeper idea with doing the works of mercy? And it's sort of some of the things I'm not going to be able to tie it all together. But when I was when listening to you guys talk, it's reminding me that um, the works of mercy are a gift to us. Yeah. And and there's a very amazing. It was one of the most amazing passages in the whole of John Paul II's encyclical on divine mercy, where he talks about. Mercy is always a bilateral reality. Yeah. Yeah. In other words, he, he goes so far as to say that if we do a work of mercy, although he doesn't put it exactly like this, we do a work of mercy and we're not conscious 
as we're doing it, that we are being blessed by that person just yeah. as much we're blessing him, it's not mercy. Right. Right. Mercy is always a two-way street, a yeah. two-way reality. And that's why it's a gift for us. That's and we great. have to recognize that's a gift for us. Yeah. This is a, the, the, I can't remember exactly your words, but it just struck me with that, is that this is a gift. It's a, it's a privilege for us to be able to do the works of mercy. It's part of our salvation. That's it's right. an opportunity. They're allowing us to do God-like action. They're allowing us to do those things so that someday, at the end of our lives, we can hear the Father say to us, you did it to me. Right. They're providing opportunities for us. Right. What a blessing. But if we don't see it that way, if we just see like I'm on a pedestal, and, oh, let me help this, and we're checking off the boxes of the works of mercy, w that's not gonna motivate us. But if we see it as this is an act of gratitude for what I've been given, yeah. and this is, a, this is a gift that I have to be able to do these works yeah. because it helps, helps my salvation, but it also is a, is a gift and privilege because I'm, I'm acting like God. Right. And so often people who do it will invariably end up hearing themselves say, I got more out of it yes, than they did. So well, you, you think of the Good Samaritan who bends over this stricken man right. on the side of the road. He's giving him mercy, but at the same time, he really is the recipient of, of a yep. mercy, a merciful opportunity mm -hmm. to do something generous. Yeah. Yep. And even as the, we talked about earlier, even the ordinary ways, you, you talk about in the book, you know, your sister as a, as a, as a homemaker, as a mom, mm -hmm. how she is feeding the hungry, how she is giving drink to the thirsty, how she's clothing the naked, sheltering the, the home. You know, all of those ways that even in our simple ways, if it's, if it's recognizing, conscious of it. yeah, mm -hmm. to think that, that, that with great gratitude, all that I've been received, and these children are dependent upon me as a father, as a breadwinner, all those yeah, different things. A lot of the things that we do in our daily lives are already potential works of mercy but it's that we have to recognize it as such. We have to do it with the right intentions, not go to work grumbling, but say, I'm feeding the hungry of my children. That's right. And my, and my, my family and things. And that, and that when it's done with that intention, it's in, the intention changes little deeds into great deeds of love. You know, as St. Therese said, little things with great right. love. Listen, right. at the deepest yeah. level, you're giving Jesus to Jesus. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Stay with us on Franciscan University Presents. When I think of mercy, I think of Mother Teresa of Calcutta when she said, give until it hurts. And the spiritual work of mercy that we can practice is consoling the afflicted, and a corporal work of mercy we can practice is feeding our family, friends, and loved ones. In my experience of the Lord's mercy, I've grown to learn that um, His healing love is His mercy. And then when he encounters suffering, that's when he brings forth his mercy. I am a communication arts major, the president of Film Club, and an editor for Franciscan University Presents. It's really great to be able to work on Franciscan University Presents because it is a national television show on EWTN. And in a lot of other schools, you're not going to have that kind of ability to put that on a resume. When I graduate, I know that I'm going to, to be firm in sticking with my faith and you know going to daily mass and a frequent confession and things like that. Because instead of just learning with my mind or just focusing on schoolwork, I, I actually you know can grow with my whole person. Franciscan University is academically excellent and passionately Catholic. Welcome back to Franciscan University Presents. This program springs forth from the very heart of Franciscan University in Steubenville, Ohio. Uh, we're recording this show right now in our communication arts studio here in uh, Steubenville, Ohio. Our students are operating the camera and equipment here. Our panelists, our, our theology faculty here at the university. Actually, uh, Father Michael is also an alumnus of the university, so it's very much part of who we are and our mission to the world. Um, so we've talked a lot about the foundations of mercy, the understanding, uh, both theological but also some very practical ideas. Your book is beautiful in that it really is a practical guide, as you say in, in, in the subtitle here. But let's go through the works of mercy uh, to give us some real practical insights in this last segment. Sure. Uh, you know, we talked about the, distinction, the traditional approach where there's 14 categories, right. seven uh, spiritual, seven uh, in the corporal, seven's corporal. Um, this, then some scripture in Matthew 25, that passage where, you know, the title of the book, You Did It to Me. Uh, Lord, when do we see you hungry and thirsty and, you know, all these uh, different works of mercy. So there's a way that um, I think it's helpful to kind of remember, the, at least we it's all helpful do for now. me. It's <laughs> kind of crazy and we've all joked about it. Uh, it's very crazy. Maybe they'll even, I'm not sure if B-roll or something, they could put up the image. But there was a word uh, that is a way I remember the five cat scriptural categories and it's, 
uh, high school ninjas uh, stab porcupines, <laughs> which you will never forget. Um, put, put that image out there. And high, school, high school ninjas stab porcupine. The idea is because if you're a high school ninja, not a fully graduated ninja, you're going to make a silly mistake like stabbing a porcupine that has quills longer than your ninja sword. Gotcha. If you see the picture, it'll make sense. <laughs> but the idea, the reason I bring up that bizarre phrase is it helps us remember each one of those uh, words in that sentence helps us remember one of the, 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 the different five categories. So high school, or high, uh, is for hungry, hungry, as in feed the hungry. And we also bring in their uh, give drink to the thirsty, ties in with that. Uh, second, stab, uh, that's for stranger, as in welcome the stranger. High school ninjas, N and ninjas, uh, naked, as in clothe the naked. High school ninjas stab, again there's another S, this one is the sick, as in visit the sick. High school ninjas stab porcupines, the P in porcupines is for prison, visit those in prison. Yeah. So those are the five categories and the, the reason I like that is uh, not just get the ninjas in your mind but to remember well, you can then meditate on that and you can even do an examination of conscience as you're reflecting on those things because that's what we're going to hear at the very end. Jesus is going to ask us these things, the Lord's going to ask us how have we done this? How have we fed the hungry, welcomed the stranger, clothed the naked, you know, visit the sick, visit those in prison? Uh, so that's one way that we can remember the practical. Let, let me say one thing, yeah. because when I got to that part of the book where I saw high school ninjas stab porcupines. You put it down and said, I got to get I out thought, of here. I thought, this is silly, this is outrageous, this, <laughs> you know. But what I discovered a little while later, you can't get it out of your mind. That's you the know? idea. It's and in that's your, what it's makes it forever. such a good and effective mnemonic device. Because, I mean, it's, it's, I, I came up with a better list but I forgot what it was, but I couldn't forget what you gave <laughs> That's me. Right. That's right. And I still resent you. <laughs> right. and, and also too, just the reality that when it's simple, when it's memorable, we'll actually repeat it more That's often. Right. And we'll yeah, think like, about it and it'll be in our minds. Well, so I, I know memorable. what a porcupine is, but what the hell is a ninja? <laughs> <laughs> Ask your team. That's a generation. <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah. Ninja, so so yes. let's, let's, go through, let, let's go through very briefly uh, and some practical ideas sure. when we think about the hungry, you know, okay. hungry and thirsty. What, what, what can we do as Catholics when we think about feeding the hungry? Sure. And, and uh, we can't go through the whole book, obviously, with all the recommendations, because there's lots of recommendations. Yes. One big one is my, which comes from my sister. My sister, um, she's got seven kids, and yes. some, sometimes she's in the hospital you know, with, the, with the kids. And one of the things she says she loves so much is when neighbors have gone and made meals for the family when she was in the hospital or something. Yeah. Yep. Um, you know, little things like that. Sometimes if we know someone in our community, they're, maybe they're going through a, a really difficult time. We know someone. Yeah. They volunteer to make a meal. I remember my sister said, "There's the greatest thing you could do for a mom is make a meal for her family. It's right? so, so true. That's, that's one practical thing. But of course we can volunteer soup kitchens and, and, and things like that. Um, or even start one you even talked or, about. Or even yeah. start one. Or just, again, as we said in the last segment, just if you're, a, if you're a breadwinner or a homemaker, if you're preparing meals, if you're uh, earning the, f the money that buys the food, to do it with an intentionality of I'm feeding my family, but yeah. not just go through the motions, but to do it, I want to do this as an act of love. I'm to doing feed this the for Jesus. As a work of mercy for Jesus and of love for my family. Yeah, yeah. You know, there's a way in which we can escape ourselves through this sort of list, you know, uh, whether it's the five or the two sets of, of, of seven each. Because, you know, we're feeding our family. Well, when we're going out and giving alms or visiting those who are in prison, we're taking care of our family. That's we're just right. reminding ourselves that our family is a lot bigger than just my own natural mm -hmm. human carnal family. It, it really is God's. And, you know, I, I think this is really embedded in Scripture and it's part of our tradition. You know, you also talk about almsgiving and it reminded me of Tobit, one of my favorite Old Testament books that I didn't have before I became a Catholic, you know. And, and how he would bury the dead. And he would go out of his way to find those in need, you know. And as I read commentaries on Tobit, I discovered that long before Jesus, the rabbis had this idea that when you give alms to the poor, you're really giving a loan to God. Mm. What a reliable line of credit that is, you know, because mm. you're going to get it back. And, and so then suddenly grace and God's mercy is sort of the, uh, the interest that he pays you yeah. on the loan that you give. And, there's such a radically different way of thinking about mercy in the Word of God, thinking of it about in terms of the covenant, and that, that these people out there, Jesus suffered and died for them every bit as much as He did for me. If I don't allow Him to help me 
think of them as brothers and sisters. I'm toast yeah. eternally, yeah. you know. Yeah. I mean, there is something dynamic about the Christian uh, story and the discipleship that uh, it enjoins upon all of us. It's a movement, a coursing, you know, a transition from God to the world. The mm -hmm. Spirit calls the world into the church, but at the same time, He calls the church into the world. And this movement into the world uh, is, is meant to be church. I mean, I think of Mary. She receives the word on the Feast of the Annunciation, and no sooner does that happen, she's climbing a hill to go visit her cousin in the visitation. That's the apostolate. And if it's not an apostolate of mercy, then it's really phony. Uh, it's incomplete. Mm -hmm. wow. So, second was S, right? Was that the was stranger? School. In school. That's yes. for stranger. stranger. Yeah, so uh, one practical thing with strangers is, uh, that's in the book is something uh, that there was this little pamphlet called The Apostolate of Smiling. Smiling. Yes. Uh, yes. And it was a kind of, it seemed a little corny at first, but as you're reading it, it gets to the end and it's very profound. And it's basically saying, you know, that, um, and this goes back to Evangelii Gaudium too, is that the attractiveness mm. of the gospel in our joy. Yes. And that yeah. we could ask ourselves and do examination of uh, conscience. There's a lot of people who are, are strangers. And we've got to use prudence, you know, we don't go around smiling maybe in a dark alley or something, right? But, but the idea is, it, it, you know, it's sometimes when we go to the grocery store things, we, we pass by everyone and yeah. maybe just the apostle of smiling, or even in our own families. You know, sometimes right. we're at work and we're happy and smiling, and everybody, we get home and, you know, it's right. like we become somebody different and, and brooding. And, but to give, uh, to welcome the stranger through the apostle of smiling, of smiling yeah. through our joy, of making yeah. that effort. Mother Teresa would always say, if you don't want to make a smile, make a smile yeah. to, to reflect right, the joy right. of the gospel. And yeah, there's a, a, a line from Leon Bois. He's, he says that joy is the most infallible sign of God's presence. Yes. And you mentioned Mother Teresa, and I thought of her immediately. I mean, here was a woman who, who experienced the dark night, what, 40, 50 years, and yet she radiates uh, this joy. Her, her face is wreathed in smiles all the time, and you would think uh, she's having a mystic experience, but no, it's the dark night, mm -hmm. and yet she overcomes that out of love uh, for the and world. It's, and it's not a phony thing. Like, no, it's, oh no. You make, but it, I think C.S. Lewis talks about, you make a smile even if you don't want to, but then it's like, it's like God's grace. You make a and then it's filled with Like priming with the grace. Yeah, yeah. yeah. and then it's like, more. then it is authentic, but you know, it takes Yeah, you Saint fake Jose. it. I believe until you fake it. Until you fake it. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> Saint Jose Maria, I remember when I was discovering his spirituality. You know, my, my wife wasn't sure what to think of it because she wasn't Catholic yet. You know, but she knew what the meaning of mortification was, you know, in terms of fasting and this sort of thing. And when I mentioned that Saint Jose Maria spoke of mortification in terms of smiling, she just fell in love with the guy, you know? Like, yeah. And I, I think that's one of the most practical expressions of putting to death our own pride, is just smiling whether we feel like it or not, and then we start to feel like it. Right. And, and I, I think that's the way mercy brings about reciprocity. You know, there, there's a new book by a Protestant named Barclay on Paul's theology of grace. And it's the notion of gift, because what Barclay has done is to go back and discover that a gift is not just received passively. In the case of grace, charis, in the first century, this sort of gift is what empowered the person to respond in a way that was really mutual and reciprocity. And, and that's what family bonds do. I mean, it isn't just giving, it's also then suddenly that feedback loop completes the circuit, as it were. Right. Yeah. Right. And so again, if we go to <laughs> yes, H, so H S uh, uh, High School Ninjas. Ninja, Ninja uh, stands <laughs> for naked, as in clothed yes. naked. Now, I think a lot of problem these days is not, um, there's, there's not a lot of naked people in the streets that you, you have clothes to, there's a lot of if, uh, Running around my house drives. sometimes. Yeah, you know, little and actually, kids. if you're from Southern California, like I am, I think well, there are a lot of naked people, but it's by choice. I think <laughs> yeah. the immodesty. Uh, immodesty and things. But the idea is, is um, one of the nakedness things that we can clothe. That's very, you know, one we could empty our closets. So probably a lot of us have too many clothes than we really need, and we can donate those. But another practical thing is clothing the nakedness of people's ignorance. You know, instruct yeah. the ignorant is one of the it's seven spiritual. or the fourteen and. Um, one of the ways we can do that is right now in the Catholic world, there are so many different resources available, like to help instruct. Even if we're not great at preaching, or you know, a lot of times I'll put my foot in my mouth and things like that. And, but if I get a good, there's all these great Catholic CDs. You know, this guy has some great ones, or whatever, different books to be able to give them to friends and let those yeah. things speak to themselves. People who just 
don't know. And it's a way of evangelizing. That's a way of clothing the naked. People who don't have the riches and of the truth of Christ and uh, don't know about Christ and to be able to, uh, to share things. And feeding, you're feeding the hungry. I mean, it, yeah, there really is a yeah, hunger it's, it's a spiritual, that is spiritual that is, spiritual, that is not shallow but deeper than physical. Yeah, I mean, if absolutely. you've got something great but you don't want to give it away, I think uh, the suspicion grows that maybe it's not so great right. or maybe you've never really been convicted of its greatness. So love has to be diffusive of itself. It needs to radiate out to those who do not yet have it. Yeah, so we go H, S, N, and then sick. S. Uh, the sick, uh, yes. Uh, there's, let's see, with the sick, it's, um, you know, a lot of times people who are sick, we want to avoid them because when we don't want to get sick <laughs> That's ourselves. Right. That's right. But the idea is, um, you know, there's little things that we can do for people who are sick, and we can just ask ourselves, is there anybody sick in our, among our friends or families? Mm. Maybe letting them know, because a lot of times people sort of scatter, giving them a phone call or getting some popsicles or, you know, doing something like that uh, for people who are, are sick. But also, uh, when people are sick or suffering in different ways, to, to remind them in a very t tactful way of, you know, say, hey, would, you're suffering a lot, and that has a lot of value before the Lord. Would you pray for me? Mm -hmm. You know, and reminding them in, 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 ta in tactful ways of offering up their sufferings, uh, because in a lot of ways, the people who are sick, the people who are suffering are the most the biggest prayer powerhouses in the church. Right. And that could be a way of comforting the sick. Right. Yeah. Well, that was a, that's Pope Francis's uh, image, the church as a field hospital, that's right. which presupposes there's a lot of sickness out there that needs right. to be assuaged. Both physical and spiritual. Right, okay. and, and the recognition of that is a kind of grace yeah. that, that I'm going to help you because, you know what, I need it more than you do. Yeah. Uh, and maybe you'll reciprocate right. uh, and help me. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. And the last one is P. P stands for prison, uh, as in visit those in prison. Now, it's not always easy. Prison ministry is incredible, and if you it can do perfect. it, I mean, it's an amazingly uh, rewarding ministry. But one, uh, there's uh, some prisoners that are all, almost more com forgotten, maybe, than prisoners in our, in our prison system, and that's the souls in purgatory. Mm. You know, prison, uh, purgatory is sometimes described as a prison. That's right. And, you know, the people in purgatory, they can't pray for themselves. They have to rely on us. And I can think of few works of mercy that are so easy and yet mean so much right. to someone right. else. And right. sometimes we're forgetting about that. And so, you know, I encourage uh, people, sometimes it's not talked about as much these days, but to pray for the souls in purgatory. A lot of times at funerals, they're like canonization ceremonies. But to remember, people are in purgatory. They want our prayers. I remember Brother Fred, who just passed away two days ago. I went to visit him. And uh, I remember his words where he's like, pray for me. Yeah. Pray Don't for forget me. me. Yeah. Pray for me. And, no, there and are other kinds of that. prisons. That's a good reminder because, you know, I, I'm thinking of my son and my daughter-in-law and, and how they go to a retirement home with religious sisters. And you find yeah. out that the loneliness and yes. the solitude becomes yeah. a kind of yes. prison. And, you know, what they've discovered is, once again, we're more blessed than those. But, I mean, these retired women are these religious sisters are it's, just, mm -hmm. I mean, overflowing with gratitude Absolutely. and joy. Kimberly has also made a point at times of finding the people who are alone as widows or widows in, in houses. I mean, it's a kind of prison there too. We had, you know, three houses away from us we didn't know, but this, this you know, this person was in deep loneliness, you know. Yes. It's a kind of cave. Yeah. You know? And yeah. oh, Absolutely. what a difference it yeah. can make. Absolutely. Stay with us on Franciscan University Presents for our final segment. I think one of the benefits with doing a Works of Mercy, it's very much in line with uh, St. Francis and um, it's through giving that we actually in turn receive. St. Francis of Assisi, uh, in reflecting on his own life, would say that he came to know and understand the mercy of God for him by the way in which he was able to extend mercy to other people. In his case, it was the lepers outside of Assisi. For us in this year of mercy, it's important for us to come to know and appreciate the Father's mercy. And Father Michael Gately in his book gives us a, a wonderful opportunity and a lot of practical advice on how to come to know the Father's mercy by being merciful ourselves. Explore the treasures of your Catholic heritage on a Franciscan University pilgrimage. Led by inspiring spiritual directors, you'll walk in the footsteps of saints and martyrs in the Holy Land, Poland, France, and Italy. And you'll deepen your love for Jesus Christ through daily mass, confession, prayer, and the joy of Christian fellowship. Let Franciscan University lead you on a pilgrimage of faith. Find out more at franciscan.edu slash pilgrimages.
Welcome back to Franciscan University Presents. We've been talking to Father Michael Gately about mercy, particularly in this year of mercy. It's our final segment. Regis, could you start us off? Yeah, uh, a couple of uh, observations. Uh, uh, obviously, uh, one of gratitude uh, to you, Father, for the work that you've done, uh, the impact that you're having uh, in, in the order of, of grace, uh, the mercy that you mediate, uh, and your understanding of it uh, is profound uh, and, and penetrating. Uh, an another uh, thought comes to mind, uh, and this is sort of metaphysical. Why is there a world? I mean, we live uh, in, in the midst of being, but why being rather than nothingness? And the answer for the Christian is because God is in love. Mm -hmm. He's in love with us, and he's driven by that love, that thirst for us, to create, uh, to fill the world with impossible people like Scott and Michael, <laughs> myself, and, and you. And somebody once said the reason he makes so many people is because he loves to tell stories. And the people he makes are the stories he tells, and every story is incomplete. And mercy, I think, is what remedies the telling, uh, finishes the tale, makes it turn out well mm. so that it's not tragic. It doesn't end in nothingness. It ends in, in beatitude, uh, the kingdom. And that's a work of mercy, I think. Mm. Uh, if I could uh, uh, end with a passage from Shakespeare, uh, the Merchant of Venice, which is really a story about mercy. The great speech delivered by Portia. She wants to rescue Antonio, uh, who, who is about to yield up his pound of flesh because Shylock demands it in justice. And she delivers this speech. I'm compressing it. The quality of mercy is not strained. It droppeth as the gentle rain from heaven upon the place beneath. It is twice blessed. It blesseth him that gives and him that takes. And then she ends by telling us, or telling the, the court, the courtroom, that it is an attribute of God himself. And she appeals to Shylock and says, look, though justice be thy plea, consider this, that in the course of justice, none of us should see salvation. We do pray for mercy, and that same prayer doth teach all of us to render the deeds of mercy. Because we receive mercy, we are moved to give it. Mm. We don't want justice, we want mercy. Mm. Mm. Thank you, Regis. Scott. You know, Regis quoted Leon Blas earlier about joy, and it seems to me that these two things are inseparable, mercy and joy. Receiving mercy gives us joy, but then giving mercy gives us even deeper joy. I'm grateful for the acronym, you know, or for that abbreviation, you know, uh, about the porcupines, the, the high school ninjas stab porcupines. Uh, <laughs> at the same time, I'm also grateful for the two lists of seven, the corporal works of mercy and the spiritual works of mercy that you list, because as humans, we are not just souls trapped in bodies, we are embodied persons. And so the corporal works of mercy reach us down to the very heart of who we are as persons, but the spiritual works of mercy, I think in some ways are more easily and frequently forgotten. Instructing the ignorant, counseling the doubtful, admonishing sinners, bearing wrongs patiently, forgiving offenses willingly, yeah. comforting the afflicted, praying for the living and the dead. You know, I remember hearing a cardinal from South America talk about how the Catholics were reaching out to the poor with just, you know, material relief. But while the church was opting for the poor, he said, the poor were opting for the evangelicals because the evangelicals yeah. were giving them the gospel, yeah. which is something that reaches down to the soul. It doesn't bypass the body, but it shows us that the deeper hunger, the deeper thirst, the deeper kind of nakedness and imprisonment really is that estrangement from God that Jesus mm. alone can overcome. And so, you know, people like me have got to really work on the corporal works of mercy. I'm a professor. But people are out there in the world have got to realize, too, that the souls that are hungering and thirsting need the gospel. And the new evangelization, I think, is a way to reach out and really, you know, to satisfy those deepest needs that people have right around us mm -hmm. who might be fully clothed and, you know, satisfied with all of the food and drink they want. And yet, as Mother Teresa reminds us, the deepest poverty is that kind of spiritual poverty. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And you do a good job, by the way. Thank you. For this. Thank you. Thanks, Scott. Father? Um, I think 
uh, just to end with giving again the big picture, I think, of that this is the time of mercy, and this is the year of mercy. So it's like a mercy within mercy. Pope Francis, this is the great time of mercy, but we're living in a year of mercy now. And what is this year for? I think it's for two things. One, it's to experience the mercy of God ourselves, mm -hmm. to encounter the mercy of God in Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. One recommendation I would do, something that, you know, it's one thing to hear something, but there's a way that like culture and art speaks to a heart, the heart in a way words alone don't. And I would encourage everyone to get some type of image of divine mercy. That's kind of the image for our time in this time of mercy. And to look at that image and see those rays that are going forth from the heart of Jesus, which is, you know, the blood and water that gush forth from the pure side of Jesus is a fountain of mercy for us as he was dying on the cross and as he di after he died on the cross. But to look at that image and to realize that those rays don't change. They're always going out. God's mercy is always there for us. God's love for us doesn't change. We may change. We may turn our backs on it. But that love doesn't change. And when we're ready to turn away from sin and, and, and have with a contrite heart go to Him, that love and mercy is always there for us. Yes. So to experience that, to spend time be praying before the image of divine mercy and reflecting on the reality of mercy that it, that it, it, it proclaims to us. The second thing to realize is having, having received mercy, having reflected on mercy, having experienced and encountered mercy in Jesus Christ, which is the mercy of the Father, to then give that mercy to others. And you know, um, Dr. Martin uh, made me think of something. He was saying, you know, why did God create? Why is there being? It's because of mercy. Bringing mm -hmm. something from not being to being is an act of mercy. Right, right. But there's also a question of why is there suffering? The great problem of evil. I think this really begins to get to the heart. The works of mercy really address that main question. Why is there suffering? Jesus Christ did not take, come to take away suffering, but to transform suffering into love. Mm. And he did that on the cross. Why did he do that? Because the suffering of our neighbor opens up for us the space of mercy. Without suffering, we won't be moved to do that God-like act of mercy. I wonder if God allows suffering in the world, as horrible as it is, to bring good out of it, and even greater good out of it, namely to save us, by allowing us to be brought into the mystery of His mercy, that our hearts would be moved by the power of the Holy Spirit to give that love and mercy that we've received to others. It's part of the mystery of God's plan of salvation, that He's allowed mercy, but so that it can be transformed into love. And in this year of mercy, I would encourage everyone to really embrace that invitation, to embrace that grace of mercy, not only to receive it from Jesus, but to be living images of mercy, living images of Christ mm. uh, to those who are suffering around us. Mm. That's so great. Father, thank you so much for being with us. Uh, if you've enjoyed today's program, uh, you can go to faithandreason.com or just ask us for this uh, handout from um, the Pope, the Holy Father's Proclamation of the Year of Mercy. You can download it. Uh, it it's, it's definitely worth the read. I recommend you to buy Father Michael's book. Um, as you look, as, as Father just recommended, as you look at this year of mercy, make it as an opportunity for you personally to encounter mercy, uh, encounter him in that beautiful image uh, of divine mercy, but also to be on a mission. Um, let's act now. Let's not wait for tomorrow. Let's do something today to begin to live mercy and work it in our lives. Um, the entire mission of Franciscan University is to form those who are going to be transforming the world for Christ. And I want to invite you to be a part of that mission. Maybe to come and take classes here in Steubenville. Maybe it's to take classes online. Or join us at one of our dynamic conferences or our pilgrimages to holy shrines. Or be equipped through Faith and Reason and some of our other websites with great materials to be a part of the new evangelization. Be a part of Franciscan University's mission to change the world. Father, could you close us with a sure. blessing? Through the intercession of Mary Immaculate and all the angels and saints, may Almighty God bless you and those watching that they would have a, a powerful year of mercy, experiencing the mercy of God and sharing that mercy with all they meet. May Almighty God bless you, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Thank you, Father. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. To download the free handout on today's topic, go to faithandreason.com. Email your request for the handout to presents at franciscan.edu. At faithandreason.com, you can also purchase past episodes of Franciscan University Presents or request today's free handout and purchase past programs by calling 888-333-0381. That's 888-333-0381. Or call 740-283-6357.